So in Landscast Singapore, land reclamation has been an effective way to create new space and stretch land options. In fact, one of the first major projects post-independence was to reclaim land along the southeastern coast starting in the 1960s. That East Coast Reclamation project was carried out in seven phases and took three decades. The works continued on with the creation of Marina Bay that was in mid-2000. The Marina Bay Land Reclamation project started in the 1970s and after more than two decades, 360 hectares of land was reclaimed. Now today, we see the iconic landmarks including Marina Centre, luxury hotels, residences and the Singapore Flyer on that land. Well, prior to that, Singapore's first major land reclamation project was the one at East Coast, dubbed the Great Reclamation. It added a track of some 1,525 hectares along the southeastern coast of the island. It took more than three decades to become... Uh, the East Coast that we see today with homes, businesses and a beach. So how does reclamation work? Well, several steps are required. The site will first be investigated for its seabed conditions, availability of fill materials, as well as the shape of the reclaimed area. Then the environmental studies need to be carried out to assess the project's impact on water quality, water level, tidal flow, as well as marine life. Reclamation work can then be done by filling the area with soil, cement and rocks. Submerged wetlands can also be drained. And for more on this story, we speak to an expert on both coastal protection and land reclamation. James Lam is Managing Director of Coastal Engineering at Surbana Jurong. Mr Lam, welcome. Good to see you. Good evening. So you are also managing the large-scale port development project at Tuas. Uh, that is eventually going to be one of the deepest uh, megaports in the world, uh, as well as the reclamation work to expand it. Now, based on that experience, and we're not unfamiliar with the fact that you know there is a lot of reclamation to Singapore already. Why is it that Long Island is the suggested option for a low-lying area like East Coast? Well, Long Island ticks all the boxes. Uh, first of all, the Long Island protects it from the threats from the sea. So you can build a seawall along the Long Island. And behind the Long Island, you have a fresh uh, water reservoir. And the fresh water reservoir can control the upstream uh, water drainage and it can prevent uh, floods on the upstream. And at the same time, the freshwater reservoir will create another source of uh, water for Singapore. So that, that helps in all ways. And the reclamation, in fact, you know, is uh, literally opens a new canvas for the next generation to build and decide what to do uh, at the new, new land. Mm. It's interesting uh, because I imagine there are several options that right. the government has studied. And, and even now, the technical studies take years to come. So yeah. how did they actually, uh, what was the science behind this decision versus something else? Well, um, the, there could be other options. Mm. Um, you could build a wall behind East Coast, or you could build a wall just in front of the, the coast. But then the, those options are, you know, limited. And you end up you have many drainage outlets that's actually going to the sea and you need to have a lot of tidal gates and pumps houses along East Coast. Mm. And that would literally destroy what we see today as East Coast Park. Mm. So with Long Island actually opens up a new uh, opportunity for further development. And uh, that, that is uh, a lot of uh, good opportunity for for the residents and for Singaporeans. Right. In the discussions leading up to this decision, uh, are you aware if the government was informed or even inspired perhaps by uh, similar projects done in other parts of the world? Well, of course, um, there are similar projects in the places like Netherlands, mm. but there are also a lot of learning that Singapore has been doing through the years. Um, Singapore has done, as you say, deep sea walls in, in the west, in Tuas, and they have also done the polder in the east. And um, there's also a similar concept, right, at the place called Pongo. There are actually three islands of Pongo, and they've been connected by a dike. And there is actually a freshwater uh, reservoir just over at Pongo. Mm. Yeah. So these are concepts that Singapore government has been building up through the years, and there's a lot of uh, 
uh, expertise in this. Yeah, there's, there's so much that goes on with the connection of the islands. I was at Lazarus recently. I didn't even know it was connected to St. John's Island now. It is, it is. So there's, there's a lot that, that does go on. We have so many uh, islands around us, but there's going to be, there's going to be damage. There's going to be, with any, with any kind of development like that, there will be an impact. Uh, environmental as well as transboundary. Mm. How much of it will there be, do you think? Well, this long island will be built in waters like maybe 10 meters deep. And there are, there are biodiversity that is um, already discovered in Tanamera, uh, near Tanamera. So um, there are seagrasses and some corals. Um, but those are near Tanamera. And uh, can you imagine with um, the new long island, with the new kilometers of seawall, there's a lot you can do to help to regenerate, you know, uh, natural cause uh, recruitment. Yeah. Mm. So you feel it can actually be positive? Yes, I think okay. so. Yeah. Uh, what, what is your sense, though, on how long this project is going to take? I mean, we're hearing in terms like decades long, but uh, give us some kind of, uh, of a time frame here. Well, given this scale, which is very similar to what uh, the Great Reclamation in the original East Coast, it is of similar scale and of course right now the, there's more complexity because you, you need to look at water management. So I would say it would definitely be in the scale of like, you know, the 20 or even 30 years. Yeah. Decades. Decades. Decades, yes. yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So you, you're quite optimistic about this project, uh, I, am. I, yeah. I can tell. And also, you've informed us that Singapore has uh, layers of experience that it's built on uh, from previous projects like in Pongo. Mm. So it's actually perhaps uh, gained an expertise of, of a certain level to, to achieve uh, what it's trying to achieve. But uh, at this point, do you feel that perhaps there are still um, obstacles that might stand in the way from this coming to fruition? Long runway. Anything could happen. Well, I, I think there, there needs to be a study. Mm -hmm. And I understand the government is going to do their technical studies from next year onwards. And um, there will be complexities. Mm. Um, they need to understand uh, how to build the sea walls, how to do the uh, water management. So there are complexities, but I believe those are something that you can overcome. But all this happening while the climate is also changing around us. Right, right. So, so right, we are promoting uh, adaptation. Mm. So as the climate change, we need to adapt along with it. So when you are building a new seawall, you must build with the um, foresight that you know, things can happen later on and you can continue to build upon it. Yeah. Oh. All right. Well, uh, we have to leave it there uh, for now. And uh, we've been speaking uh, to James Lam, who is the Managing Director of Coastal Engineering at Sabana Jurong. Thank you, James. Thank you.